So thank you all for coming and uh, our apologies for a bit of the chaos this morning. Uh, we do have some changes that are going to affect the TAPFAR meeting, but we are all rolling with it and going to uh, have, I think, a very successful international engagement. I want to kick it off by thanking everyone for coming. We appreciate um, your, your willingness to travel, your willingness to partner, and the spirit of collaboration that you bring to TATFAR. Um, I'm Michael Craig. I'm Senior Advisor for Antibiotic Resistance Coordination and Strategy at CDC. And uh, before we kick it off, we have some announcements about the water issues that have uh, affected everyone's mornings. Uh, on behalf of the U.S., I apologize. <laughs> Um, we were told by DeKalb County that um, there was a water main break and it is uh, the largest water main break in the history of the state. Um, it affects this campus. And uh, so we, are, we, are, we have negotiated that we will be doing the opening session um, until roughly 9.30, 9.45. And then uh, the campus is going to close and we're going to have to identify alternative sites. So. When the campus closes, everyone will have to go, and we are going to be in communication with you via email on securing that alternate site and what the plan will be for the rest of the meeting. We have already uh, secured a room for Thursday and Friday, and we will be also looking to secure transportation from your hotels to accommodate. Uh, we don't have everything wrapped up in a bow yet, but we will have that, and when we do have it wrapped up in a bow, we will be communicating with you accordingly. If you are having hotel issues, um, or if your hotels are forced to close or anything like that, please let Stephanie Gumbus know and be in contact with her. We will try to secure alternative um, accommodations for you if those are necessary. Um, and we work to support and provide any guidance as we can accordingly, recognizing that this is a emergency situation that we were not apprised of until roughly 6.30 this a.m. So, with that, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Larry Kerr to introduce the meeting, and uh, we'll go with it. So thank you all for coming. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, Michael, thank you. Um, you know, I, let me first start off by saying, um, what an incredible amount of work that your team, the TATFAR Secretariat, has done to assemble all of us here. And uh, the amount of preparatory work that has gone into this has been absolutely um, breathtaking to observe. And could I just ask, could we please give them a round of applause because... <laughs> they, they absolutely deserve that. And, let me start then by saying good morning once again. Um, my name is Larry Kerr. I'm the director of the Office of Pandemics and Emerging Threats within the Office of Global Affairs at the US Department of Health and Human Services. And it is my incredible pleasure to welcome you to the TATFAR meeting of 2018, our, only our second in-person meeting. And you know, I was looking over the roster. We have 13 nations represented. We have people from governments. We have people from academia. We have people from the private sector. This is an absolute incredible gathering where despite the logistic challenges, we're gonna have opportunities to network in this time period. So even if when we are displaced this afternoon, take this opportunity to get to know one another because the value that we have in sharing and exchanging and talking will not necessarily occur during the formal sessions, but will occur often when we are able to meet one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. So, you know, in looking at the 13 nations that are represented here, I also wanted to welcome, in particular, this is the first time we've had colleagues from South Korea and Japan to join us. So we welcome them, and from traveling so far to Atlanta for this meeting, we, we, we welcome their participation. I've already recognized, but greatly, greatly want to thank the TATFAR Secretariat and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for offering us this facility, and now the incredible logistics aspects that they're going through to try and facilitate um, the ongoing aspects of this meeting uh, during the water challenge. 
I also want to acknowledge uh, the Pew Charitable Trust for their uh, support in, uh, in creating this meeting and helping us to get underway. And then to talk about the um, and thank the two keynote speakers that we will have the fortune of hearing this morning before we uh, disperse. But one of the aspects that as I was coming and thinking about and preparing for this meeting is each of us comes to this meeting with a common cause. Every single one of us wants to do every single thing we possibly can to combat AMR. From whatever our discipline, from whatever our background, whether or not we've been personally affected by diseases impacted by multidrug resistance, whether or not we come from a scientific, a medical, a public health, an advocacy standpoint, we are here for that common purpose. And so over the next couple of days and then uh, when some of us uh, convene on Friday, we are looking to take all of the information that people have and are willing to share. And so over the next couple of days, I beg you to work, to share, to debate, to learn from one another, to help us strategize what TATFAR can do over the coming years maximize its potential, and to keep it as one of the leading forces around the world, working with many other entities. I mean, we've seen the global conversation about AMR rise over the last few years. We must maintain that global commitment to action, and we must see those actions carried through. Commitments are words programs are implemented, and then we must measure those in terms of the impact that they are having upon people, upon animals, upon the economy, upon our national security, all based in the fundamental aspects that should antibiotic resistance rise, they threaten all of those sectors. And so I wish to welcome John Ryan, my co-chair, and thank all of you for your participation and look forward to the next few days learning and engaging with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Ryan. I'm the Director of Public Health in the European Commission. And I'd like to welcome you in my turn uh, here this morning to this, this important physical meeting. As Larry has just said, we don't meet uh, physically very often. Normally our meetings are done very economically, I must say, through video or audio links. And we see tiny pictures of each other in the distance. Uh, but it is, I think, important on occasion uh, to come together and actually have time to discuss and have lunch together, have coffee together, and actually bond and create the networks which are very important for the survival of any group like this. This is a very unique group, I would say. Uh, I participated in many international initiatives over the years, but this is really quite unique in the sense it's driven by a list of agreed priority actions, which are then followed up in every, in every meeting. So it's not a process-driven organization. It's driven by a list of agreed objectives, which we agree across governments and across agencies. It's really a One Health approach, which I think is really an example and a leadership to other countries in the world. And I welcome all of you here today and want to thank you as well for all your commitment because it's not very easy sometimes to get your word in in a video conference. The time is short and it's not always easy, but there is a whole process going on there behind where you have contacts with each other over the year. And I think this is an occasion to mark our appreciation for all the good work that you do and the linkages you've established between our different uh, countries. I'm also very happy to welcome the representatives of South Korea and Japan here today. I think that's also a signal that we're not a closed group, that we want to open and also share our experience in working together with other parts of the world. And, and I'm also grateful for the, the private sector representatives and the member state uh, representatives who are here because that also brings your expertise to the table. Uh, 
now, as regards the organization of the meeting, I have to express my great thanks to our colleagues in the CDC, and particularly to Michael Craig and to uh, Stephanie Gumbus and her team for all the work they've done in setting this meeting up, because it's no easy feat to establish uh, an agenda and to try and bring everybody together on an agreed day and to make it happen. And that's uh, a, a very great achievement. And also the uh, calm with which you're facing this water shortage is quite impressive. And I'm sure you'll find some solutions this afternoon so that we can continue our discussions between now and Friday. The aim of this uh, meeting is actually to review the progress which we've made so far. We had our last physical meeting in um, Luxembourg in 2015. And since then, there's been a huge amount of activity. And as Larry said, the pace has picked up. Uh, the UN General Assembly adoption of a resolution on AMR, but also the G7, G20 uh, work um, has been uh, continuing. And uh, the European Union itself adopted uh, in 2017 its own action plan, a second action plan on antimicrobial resistance. And we'll be talking about this in more detail later on. So antimicrobial resistance is a political and a health security objective for the European Union. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my Director General, Xavier prats Money, who has traveled here and to join us here in our meeting this morning to give his perspective on the challenges we face and the next steps. Xavier. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. Um, I, I, uh, I've been doing some inquiries about uh, rear admiral Shuket, and uh, I hear from sources within and outside CDC that she's a good woman to have around in a disaster. Uh, this applies mostly to the avian flu type of disasters. It applies to the common flu type of disasters, and I know that uh, uh, Dr. Shuket has done a fantastic job in this year's influenza in the US. I'm sure it applies also to water main disasters. And, and I, I, I guess this is the reason why uh, Realmul is not here with us yet. That's a very good reason. Uh, if I had to choose between addressing a water main disaster or listening to a speech by me, I, I know very well which one I would choose. Uh, having said that, I'd like to just start by saying that indeed it is really an honor for me to be here to grasp the opportunity of this only second physical meeting of the TATFAR. And the first thing I want to do is indeed to acknowledge the extraordinary work that the CDC has done, particularly its secretariat for the TATFAR. And uh, as most of us, or at least many of us, certainly myself, are bureaucrats but prefer to call ourselves public servants, I'd like to stress that uh, you, we talk about institutions, but behind institutions there is very committed, efficient, and extraordinarily dedicated people. And these people are in particular, Michael Craig has been said, Jean Patel, the chief scientist for the Task Force Secretariat, uh, and indeed Stephanie Gumbis, who makes it all come together. And I would like to just say from our heart that we are extraordinarily grateful for what you're doing to help the Task Force, Task Force go ahead. I'd like to say a few words, uh, but it will be a few. Uh, uh, I know that this is not the place to stress, it's really not needed to stress the importance and the gravity of uh, antimicrobial resistance as a challenge. Actually, this is not really a very new problem. When Alexander Fleming got the Nobel Prize in 1946, he started in his speech by warning about antimicrobial resistance. So it's not that it's a new problem, it's just a problem that is becoming extraordinarily acute. And if I, I, I had a look at the 2017 report by CDC on AMR, and it, it was, if I wasn't shocked, it's only because we have similar reports. Uh, I believe you had 270 million prescriptions of antibiotics in the US in 2015. 30% of those are necessary. I mean, is it really, really something to think about and something where we should really try to do more? Because as uh, you know, we had uh, the Gmo Lil report on antimicrobial resistance, a particularly interesting piece of work, not least because Mr. Gmo Neal comes from Treasury. He's a finance uh, minister, not a health official. And he had a very striking presentation of the economic impact and the human impact of antimicrobial resistance, which boiled down to having, if we continue like this, uh, 10 million deaths uh, of anti on antimicrobial resistance by 2050. And maybe more importantly, because this is about human people, more importantly, we risk not being able to perform things as simple as cesarean operations. So this is how, how 
see what the situation is. But I don't want to give a gloomy picture because indeed we have many good news. And many good news in terms of the progress that has been made. And importantly for all of us, in terms of the priority that our top political leaders in our own countries, in the EU, in the G7, in the G20, indeed in the General Assembly of the United Nations, has been given now to antimicrobial resistance. I believe the United Nations General Assembly has discussed health issues only four times since its beginning, just after the Second World War. One of them was uh, on AIDS, the other one was indeed an antimicrobial resistance. So this gives us a sense that there is now an opportunity. And I think, as has been already said, I think it is now up to us to grasp this opportunity and translate nice words, good intentions, aspirational statements into facts and actions. From our side, as John said, uh, we have indeed an EU action plan uh, approved on June last year. We uh, will produce uh, in, in, a, in a matter of weeks a report on the state of implementation of the action plan. This is because in our institution, and I, I, I fear in some of your institutions too, we do have sometimes action plans that have more plan than action. We were determined to avoid this. We have, as I said, an action plan that has over 70 actions and that is organized around three major themes. The first is Europe as a best practice region on antimicrobial resistance. Partly because in some, in some areas we are a best practice region, but certainly because we want to make sure that we become a best practice region and that we bring up the standards of some EU countries to the best levels that we have. We have countries in Europe so the difference between, for example, uh, when we look at the level of prescriptions, of unnecessary prescriptions in humans, we have a difference between threefold, more than a threefold difference between the best performer, the Netherlands, and the worst performer, Greece, for example. And when it comes to veterinary medicine, the difference is about 40 times between the worst and less performer. So there's a lot of room for improvement, for learning from each other. And the first strand of our action plan is about exchanging best practice, learning, but also monitoring and surveillance through ECDC indeed and through the help of CDC also. The second strand is research and uh, we are doing a significant effort as we've done in the past to make sure that we have a strong uh, element of innovation and research to compensate of course for the fact that we have not really found new strands of antibiotics for the last quarter century, but also to look at early diagnostics and improvements in other areas that will help reduce antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance. And then the third aspect is the one I would like to focus more because it is a, re a, a, a response to the fact that we are very conscious that antimicrobial resistance has to be a global effort. And this is the, why the third aspect of our action plan focuses precisely on this, on making sure that the European Union and its member countries contribute to the global agenda against antimicrobial resistance. And one of its aspects that we mentioned explicitly as a promise for the future is that far. Yesterday, uh, uh, when we arrived, we had the privilege of visiting the emergency operations center here. It was, on the one hand, reassuring because it was empty. Uh, uh, not completely empty, it's never completely empty, but it was reassuringly uh, not a hectic place at the time, which means that there was not really a big problem. But it was also a reminder of how strong the contribution of the US is to uh, fighting communicable diseases and to fighting pandemics around the world. You just need, needed to see the level of intense monitoring and the presence of CDC staff around the world. But it was also a reminder of how global the problem of antimicrobial resistance is. So this is why, as I said, our own action plan is really focused on ensuring that EU, the EU and its countries strengthen research, cooperate more with each other, but also contribute to a global agenda on antimicrobial resistance. Now, what about TATFAR? Uh, again, I think it's really quite extraordinary what we have achieved. And what we have achieved in terms of practical uh, experience, in terms of concrete operational results, two reports that have been quite extraordinary recently by, by TATFAR, so by CDC. So we have many achievements. And the question for all of us, I think, is what can we do more? And I think we may want to look at the things that we may want to do more on a number of aspects. The first is, do we want to commit ourselves to more quantified targets, to more specific objectives than we can help hold ourselves accountable to? Um, process and good practice is fine. Maybe we can think of how over the next years, now that we are midway through 
the mandate of Tatfaya? How can we try to think about specific objectives we can aim at together? The other point we may want to look at is whether there are any specific areas that deserve particular attention. And if you look at what uh, uh, AMR is as a global phenomenon, one area that comes to mind as an area where uh, the TATFA could focus more is what it could do in terms of leading the way and being an example by practice and by experience for others to follow. And the area that comes to mind immediately is the use of, uh, of antibiotics for growth purposes in animals. The EU has done extraordinary progress in this area. We've put legislation in place 11 years ago. Uh, Canada, Norway uh, have done exceptional progress. The US has done exceptional progress, FDA guidance. The private sector industry is sensitive to this issue uh, now. Can we make sure that we use the experience of TATFAR, that we use also the new partners that are being associated increasingly with TATFAR, to make sure that this issue is more present internationally and that other countries follow the experience that we have in TATFAR and do more in this area of the use of antibiotics for growth purposes in animals. This is just an example of the sort of things we could do more together. Uh, we hope that over the next two days we'll have a better chance to discuss what the partners that are now part of TATFA could do, whether we can have specific objectives to take ourselves accountable and when we meet again make sure that we can test how strong our will, will, willingness has been. And also to make sure that we as a community of countries, 13 countries presented here, can also be an example for others to follow in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll indulge me if I have a bit of a rare honor this morning. And I say rare because I have the opportunity to introduce someone to you all that I view as a hero. Um, Dr. Ann Shuket is an individual that is absolutely remarkable, and I, I want to sing her praises for just a second. I've had the honor of knowing Ann since around 2006, but her distinguished career begins at CDC in 1988, where she was an epidemiological intelligence service officer. Ann, as a person, is a leader. She is a physician scientist where I've seen Anne go toe to toe with the best experts in medicine, public health, epidemiology, and be the advocate for public health writ large. She's an individual that knows not only just you know, one or two diseases, but she knows diseases writ large and has and expertise across many areas. In, in 2006, when we were working on the National Strategy for Pandemic Influenza, Anne was the voice for CDC that helped launch not only the domestic, but the global efforts to prepare for influenza that last and those capabilities exist today. She's an incredible advocate to our Congress fighting for CDC's budgets and programs and making sure that those make it out to our states and international partners. She's an absolute leader in the sense that she's been asked many times to step up into the leadership position and guide this incredible institution that is CDC, both domestically and the global efforts. And I've seen a remarkable capability for, in one breath, to be briefing the president and the cabinet members and defending CDC's recommendations and guidance and policy advice, and in the next breath, turn to the public and be able to explain those in lay terminologies in a way with confidence and a manner in which they understand, respect, and appreciate. So when I say I have the honor, I really would ask you to help me welcome to the stage Dr. Ann Shuket, Admiral, Rear Admiral, excuse me, within the Public Health Service Corps. Th thanks so much, Larry. And um, my mother sent him those remarks. Um, it's it's um, a delight to look out and welcome you. I, I, um, 
I don't know how much has been said already about the excellent water supply here in DeKalb County and here at the campus. So I, um, I am so sorry for what you all went through at your hotel and what you're going through here. And I understand after my remarks, we're likely to be moving the meeting to uh, another uh, facility. But I, um, I definitely wanted to have a, a few minutes with you this morning to um, let you know how important I think this work is and, and give you sort of my personal take on the Transatlantic Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance and the challenges that you face and the opportunities that you have. Um, in preparing to speak with you, I was thinking back 15 years ago to an antimicrobial resistance meeting that I attended downtown in Atlanta. It was a convening of 27 states around the United States where we were working together with state health departments on the new challenges we were having with drug-resistant respiratory infections, particularly streptococcus pneumonia. I see Marion shaking her hand, head. She was probably at that meeting, too. It was March of, 2000, uh, March of nine, uh, 2003, and um, it made a real impression on me. The, the public health and health care and, and many states were convening with federal partners to talk about the issues, but what really made an impression on me was returning from that meeting downtown to the CDC, to what was then the National Center for Infectious Diseases, and sitting in a small conference room with a few of my colleagues from around NCID, including Dr. Kabaz, who was then in viral diseases, and learning of an unusual, severe illness occurring in nurses in Hanoi at a hospital, and in a multi-generation cluster in Toronto, Canada, and in um, hospitals in Hong Kong. Um, CDC was getting reports from WHO and um, partners in other countries about what was going to be called the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, a nightmare infectious disease with no treatment that was jumping continents, affecting healthcare, and um, frightening the public. Today, antimicrobial resistance has a lot in common with the, antimicro uh, with the SARS uh, pandemic. The issue of infections that we don't know how to treat, challenges with diagnostics, ability to spread rapidly, um, silently, from country to country, and a critical role for the human-animal interface. Um, as I looked at the agenda of what you are trying to tackle and why the transatlantic partners really do need to come together in both a multilateral and bilateral way, I realized that um, the SARS story um, really resonates. So I know that um, your three days of meeting, where we do hope to get you water and power and bathrooms, for instance, um, I know that you have a chance to roll up your sleeves and continue to make progress, but I, I just want to say how important the connection between countries is, the connection between sectors, the role of detection and response and containment, as well as the opportunities for prevention. Um, we heard a little bit about antibiotic use in on the farm or in agriculture. Clearly, we have a focus on improving antibiotic stewardship in healthcare and in the community. Um, these are not issues that are the purview of one doctor or nurse, one hospital or facility, or one country. And so the ability to work together is vital. I also heard a little bit about best practices, and I know as I was learning about Candida auris and this, this really nasty new fungus that it was the UK experience that, that helped us understand how to tackle that in our own facilities. Last week we had a great event in wa Washington with congressional staffers around the antimicrobial resistance challenge here in the US and going from discovery and research through to delivery and containment, we, we have um, a job to do. We heard about Alexander Fleming, and um, I just want to tell you my own story, that um, my, my uncle was a, a, a pulmonary physician, actually, in, and did his training in the 1940s here in the United States, and described to me taking care of patients, you know, in Brooklyn, New York, before 
there was penicillin and after there was penicillin and seeing the difference it made for pneumonia patients. That was my uncle's story in, the, in his medical career. Now, my nephew, having knee surgery, the same week that I got the MMWR report about the nasty graft-related infectious diseases that were being spread in minor surgery, um, realized that in, the, scores, in, the, in the, the course of just a couple generations, we've gone from breakthrough drugs to nightmare infections. So what you're doing together as TATFAR, as multilateral and bilateral, and as um, individual leaders is just critical. CDC and the US government place antimicrobial resistance as a top priority. We, I am here to reaffirm that we continue that in this administration. We're really looking forward to working together on the family of issues. And um, I will apologize again that we do not have water. So um, thank you so much for um, all you're doing. And again, Larry, thank you for that nice introduction. Thanks. Good morning again. <laughs> so we have information on uh, our alternative plans for the day. Um, but did you know that CDC has a museum? <laughs> and it's on this very campus. And it has a lovely exhibit right now related to Ebola. And that's what we're going to go look at next. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we're going to uh, we're going to have to exit here because they're going to have to close these facilities because the campus is closed. But we are going to take, uh, we're all, we're all going to go look at the museum. It is a, a, an affiliate of the Smithsonian, so it's a real deal museum. Um, and while we are waiting there, uh, we have secured transportation from the CDC shuttles to take us to an alternative site for today. So we are, we are going to continue the meeting today. We might have to alter the schedule accordingly, um, but we will have shuttles to take us to the uh, alternative site. It won't be as luxurious as we you have here, but we will do our best. Um, and we will have shuttles to take folks back to both the Emory Conference Center and the Decatur Courtyard uh, later this evening. We have secured the, the same building um, for Thursday and Friday, and we will have shuttle transportation in the morning and evening to and from. So uh, there'll be a little bit of hiccups here, but in the meantime, thank you all for a wonderful morning session. Um, and continue to um, have some bilateral discussions, and we'll head out to the uh, CDC Museum while we await our transportation. Thank you. <laughs>